short video for you. series this morning or this week or this month or however long it takes of the fruit of the spirit and uh we're continuing that today but before i get started with that i did want to take a a second and i know we have visitors here this morning and i want to tell you how uh thankful i am that you're here uh we know that there are a lot of churches you can choose to go for go go to and uh, we're glad you chose to come with us i need you to tell you just amen amen If you see somebody, if you're a regular attorney, you see somebody you don't know, don't just wave at them as you go by. Stop and talk to them. Make them feel welcome. We, uh, listen, uh, uh, there are a lot of kids in the service today, and I know some of our visitors came today with children thinking, oh, I get a break from my kid, and it's the fifth Sunday. Uh, And so every fifth Sunday of of the, uh, every month that's a fifth Sunday, our children's church uh, for older kids doesn't meet. And and, uh, so... That's just, we got to give our children's workers a break or they'll revolt and they'll come after the pastor. So, 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 but, uh, but thank you for being here. And uh, I won't be more than an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> I promise you I won't be that long because my wife will come up here and drag me off of the platform. But, uh, but uh, I, I'm so thankful that you're here as a visitor. If this is your first time to be with us, if you'll, if you'll see me out in the foyer after the service, I'll be out there, and I want to see you. I want to meet you. I'm not, here, we're not, I'm not going to harass you. I'm not going to uh, track you down or anything like that. But I do would like to send you a, no, a letter, a note from me, and a, and a gift. And, uh, and then you might get a phone call this week just saying if there's anything we can do for you. But there's a card out there. I'll have it. My, me and my wife will have that card. If you'll fill that out, you'll get a gift in the mail. And so uh, if you don't fill it out, you won't get a gift. You still might get the, you still might, if you don't fill it out, I'll run you down in the parking lot. How about that? No, I'm kidding. But anyway, so glad you're here. And that's enough of that. Thank you. We're not going to, we're not going to make you stand up and wave your arms. If you, if you do that, you're welcome. We'll just wave back at you, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to make you feel uncomfortable. But we are in the fruit of the Spirit, and we are, we are, we are uh, today we're at peace. We've gotten to peace. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. 
I, I was doing some uh, looking some stuff up online this week about peace. Uh, it's reported that from the year 1496 B.C. to the year A.D. 1861, uh, in 3,358 years, there were 227 years of peace. Okay, did you hear that? 3,358 years. And out of that 3,358 years, there were 227 years of peace. And 3,130 years of war. Or 13 years of war to every year of peace. Within the last three centuries, there have been, give or take... Around 286 wars in Europe. Uh, the researcher added that from the year 15 BC to AD 1860, more than 8,000 treaties, peace treaties, were signed, meant to remain in force forever, but uh, the average time they remained in force was only two years. Peace. Peace, peace. Wonderful peace, falling down from the Father above. That's the only place real peace comes from, is from the Father above. Amen. Jeremiah told us about those in his day who cried, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And it's still the same today. People are still crying out for peace, but, but we'll never have peace. I laugh when I hear about the peace talks in the Middle East. And, and it's obvious that those people that are going to these peace talks don't read the scriptures because there's never been peace in the Middle East. Never. And there never will be till Jesus comes back. But because if we believe, but, but if we believe that peace is the absence of war, we'll never experience peace. If we believe as the ancient Greeks believed that peace is the removal of pain, the elimination of of desire and the killing of emotion, then we'll never know peace. So if peace is not the absence of war, the removal of pain or, or warm feeling that you get inside, when, then what is it? What is it? When Paul tells us in Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is peace, what's he talking about? Let's take some time to try and answer that question today. First, if we're going to understand how peace can be an integral part of our lives, we need to know, we need to know this. We need to know God's peace. In, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Then God's peace will watch over your hearts and your minds, and he will do this because you belong to Christ Jesus. God's peace can never be completely understood. And then in Philippians 4, 9, it says, Do, do what you have learned or received or heard from me. Follow my example. The God who gives peace will be with you. Paul, in, in, that, in those writings in Philippians, uses two specific phrases there. He, he uses God's peace, and he uses the God who gives peace. So let's look at the second one first, the, the God who gives peace. This description occurs several times throughout Paul's writings in, in the New Testament. And it seems to be his favorite uh, title for God, the God who gives peace. And the description of God points us to him as the source of our peace. If he is the God who gives peace, then we have to go to him if we're going to find peace in our lives. You can search the world over till you think you find true love or true peace. But you're not going to find it until you find God. You're not going to find it. Christ desires us to have peace. He desires us to have peace. If we don't have it, we miss part of the blessings of a, being a Christian. Now, now, that's a simple statement, but I think we make it too hard, too complicated. We think that peace of mind, we think that peace of mind when we're in the midst of a storm can only be for the super saints, right? The people that got it all together. Who knows how to, who, who, who knows how to have super faith, right? Well, that's who we think finds peace. Since most of us know ourselves well enough to know that we're not super anything we figure that we're not ever going to have that kind of experience those those experiences of peace are not for us no 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 Jesus wants every Christian to experience his peace Amen. everyone how many of us lived in peace this last week okay good for you awesome awesome I didn't I'm raising my hand to get you to raise it uh how many of you have you had peace today some of you have. If not, if not, what's wrong? 
What's wrong? Where does peace begin? In the words of Job's friend, Eliphaz, obey God and be at peace with him. Obey God and be at peace with him. Then he will help you succeed. That's in Job chapter 22. The, it begins as we get acquainted personally with the mighty prince of prince and king of kings. The Messiah is foretold as the prince of what? Peace. The prince of peace. His peace enters the heart by the Holy Spirit and makes it independent of all outside conditions. It, it, we can't hope for a life without sorrow. There's going to be sadness. There's going to be sorrow in your life. Someday you'll be standing at a casket with someone else holding the hand, holding their hand as they're looking at their, their loved one. That's just the way life is. You, you were born today and you will die tomorrow. And someday there will be sadness in your life. And someday someone will be standing with you helping you to get through that sadness. The peace of God can, but the peace of God can turn that sorrow into joy. When joy isn't possible, peace is. And with this knowledge comes peace. Peace in the pain and sorrow. Lord, you will give perfect peace to those who commit themselves to be faithful to you. Isaiah said those words. You will, be, you will give perfect peace to those who commit themselves to be faithful to you. And there's the promise. There's the music in these words of the old prophet. You will give us peace, Lord. Why then can't we hear the music in our own lives? First, we need to stop trying to manufacture this peace feeling. We can't keep ourselves in peace. We can't. The Bible says, Lord, you will give perfect peace. It's the Lord who will do the keeping, not you. The Lord watches over you. Psalm 121.5, he will keep you in perfect peace. We need to believe that God doesn't need to get a good night's sleep to do his watching or work properly. God doesn't need a good night's sleep. He doesn't need eight hours, nine hours. Some of you do. You're a little grouchy. But, but, but he, doesn't ever, he doesn't need to sleep. He, knows that he never slumbers. It says in Psalm 121, He who watches over you won't get tired. He doesn't get tired. The Lord will keep you from every kind of harm. He will watch over your life. He will. He will. He promised and he will. The most, the most insignificant things in our lives can send us off in a panic, can't they? They spoil our days. Somebody looks at you wrong and you're going, oh boy, thanks for spoiling my day. Right? Have you heard that before? It, it, darkening the, of the blue skies and putting out the stars, whatever, doesn't take much, does it? If we want continual peace, then we must have continuous trust in, in the little things as well as the big things. Every one of us should have peace. If we don't have it, we're living below our privilege. If you don't have peace, you're living below your privilege. This is the will of God, and it is only in the faithful doing God's will that peace can be found. When we are focused on God and others first, we will know the peace of God. Selfishness always hinders peace. If all you're thinking about is yourself, you're not going to have peace. You've got to think about others and you've got to think about God. Keep your eye on the prize. And you're not it. Sorry to burst your bubble. People everywhere search for peace. They sing songs about it and they traveled on pilgrimages to find it. They even wage war to protect it. And many wealthy, famous, and powerful people would trade everything for just one moment of peace. Many times what they find instead is the world's false peace, which is different from the peace offered by Jesus. John 14, 27 says, I leave my peace with you. I give my peace to you. I do not give it to you as the world does. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The peace, the peace offered by the world is an empty promise and it can only bring temporary comfort. God's peace is a permanent peace offered by the only one who can be trusted to keep his word. And heal us from our sin. The world's peace is short-lived. And you know what? There, you may find a little peace in the world, but eventually the circumstance will change and boom, it's gone. 
The world's peace changes with the, the tiniest of circumstance. The peace that Jesus promised can only be disturbed if we allow doubt and fear to dominate us instead. We have to submit to him and trust him to be as good as his word. You, Julie was talking to me the other day about a preacher she heard on TV, and he, it was a great point, and, 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 and it fits here. You know, there's things in our lives, and, 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 and we go to God with them, and we lay them at the feet of Jesus. And we say, God, here, I can't do this anymore. Forgive me of this. Take this. Take it away from me. And we give it to him, and he does, and he takes it away. But then the devil, the enemy, gets on our back, and he starts reminding us of those things and saying, hey, hey, remember this? Hey, remember that? Oh, you can take one drink. Oh, you can take one uh, pill. You can do this. You're not gonna, it's not going to affect you. Oh, you can go to this place. Oh, you can do that. Oh, you can do this. And we start dwelling on that. And we start dwelling on that, and our mind gets off of the prize. Our mind gets off of God, and it gets on the things that, 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 that take away our peace. And before long, you're enslaved to it again. You need to get away from that. If that thought enters your head, this is what the preacher said. If that thought enters your head, rebuke it immediately. Say, get thee behind me, Satan. Get away from me. I don't need this. God has taken this and he's taken it away from me and it's not upon me anymore. You are a liar, devil. You are a liar. Get away from me. Do not be a part of it. And that's what we need to do. The world, the world will come in on you like a swarm of bees. And they'll say you need this and you need this and you need this and you need this. And there's no peace in that. You need Jesus. That's what you need. You need Jesus. The peace of the world is an empty promise. It's an empty promise. Jesus' peace is what you need, and he is as good as his word. God is the source of our peace. And if we want to have peace in our lives, we can't get it from anything or anyone but him. This description, the the God who gives peace, also tells us that God is the substance of peace. He not only gives peace to us. God is at peace himself. But what about this other phrase, God's peace that Paul uses? Is, this is telling us that God wants to share his peace with us. When asked what's wrong with the world today, many will point to a up and down volatile stock market, corrupt government, disappearing rainforest, poor diets, lack of health care, broken families, overcrowded schools, the list goes on and on. The world tries to fix these problems by doing good, feeding children, building wells, regulating markets, conserving wildlife, funding charter schools, and thereby they they achieve a certain semblance of peace, right? The world's peace tries to fix the symptoms of sin, but fails to see how the root of the problem is the sin disease itself. They just throw money at it or throw people at it. But until we get to the root of the problem, which is the sin, it's never going to be fixed. Look around you. Some of you are a lot older than me, or older than me, not a lot, I'm pretty old, but you're older than me, and can you ever remember it being this way? I can't. Sin is the problem. Money, I don't care. How many trillions of dollars you throw at a problem until you get to the root of the problem you're not going to fix it. And sin is the root of the problem in the world today. we got to get to the root of that problem and deal with that sin and throw it, get it, cast it in the sea of forgetfulness and, and repent. And then the, the, it'll be, the problem will be taken care of. The world tries to fix problems by throwing money at it. Regulation. Reform. In contrast to the world's promise of peace, God's peace is permanent. And it's firmly grounded in his word. He doesn't ignore our sin. He heals it. Making his peace a different kind of peace than what we find in the world. When our circumstances are free of conflict, we enjoy momentary peace. But when we face difficult relationships or health problems or financial crisis, the momentary quiet is disrupted and chaos rules the day. Our God offers peace in the midst of chaos. Hallelujah. In the midst of the chaos, God offers peace. His peace doesn't change with the circumstance. It's secure in spite of the circumstance. 
all religions other than Christianity, true Christianity, have one thing in common. They all try to achieve peace with God by doing works and following rules. Christianity is different. In Christ, we are offered peace with God because we who once were off, far off, or once were far off, have been reconciled to God through Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus' sacrifice addresses the root of the problem that the world ignores. By his sacrifice, he bridged the gap that sin inserted between us and God. He took the punishment for our sin, and in exchange, he gives us peace with God. So if we're going to understand how peace can be an integral part of our lives, we need to know God's peace. Amen? And secondly, we need to receive the gift of peace. The world, the, the word peace runs through the whole Bible. In the Old Testament, in the words of a benediction used by the priests in Numbers, the promise is, may the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Here, it's a gift of God. As Jesus met with his disciples, he was teaching them about the Holy Spirit who would be sent after he left the earth. And while Jesus was speaking, he gave the promise found in John 14. It goes like this, I leave my peace with you. I give my peace to you. We need to understand that the peace of God is a gift. It's not something we earn. You can't earn it. It's something that God has chosen to give us willingly and freely. We are not worthy of it. No one in this room, no one is worthy of God's peace. We simply receive it gratefully from God's loving hand. Jesus told his disciples he was leaving earth, but his peace would remain. In other words, although Jesus would no longer be physically present, His peace would always be available. So how does Jesus give us his peace? Paul tells us in Romans, he says, in Romans chapter 5, he says, We have been made right with God because of our faith. Now we have peace with him because of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to Jesus in faith, he not only saves us from our sin and promises eternal life, he also gives us his peace. Jesus not only wants us to be in a relationship with him, which he does, He wants us to have what he has. He wants us to experience the peace that he himself enjoys. So we need to know God's peace. We need to receive the gift of peace. And thirdly, we we need the presence of peace. In the second half of that verse in John 14, 27, uh, Jesus tells us what it's like for those who have the presence of his peace in their lives. It says, I do not give it to you as the world does. I don't give it to you like the world does. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This verse in John goes along with, uh, with, with, with Jesus' words in Philippians. Then God's peace will watch over your hearts and your minds. He will do this because you belong to Christ Jesus. God's peace can never be completely understood. I once had a friend who was a commander in the Navy, U.S. Navy. Uh, his name was Gil Lott, big guy. You, you wouldn't believe it. He was, he was a really big guy, tall, and, and Gil spent his entire career in the Navy as a submariner. You think, well, man, you think a little guy would, you know, but he, he was a submariner. He spent his entire career, he retired from the Navy, spent, I think, as a, as a camp commander, I think he's 25 years, and his entire career he spent underwater in a submarine. Gil would tell me, he told me one time that they would sometimes stay underwater for three months at a time. Now, a nuclear submarine can stay underwater indefinitely. The only reason they have to come to the surface is to get food. Uh, They don't have to get fuel. Nuclear goes forever. Uh, But they have to come to the surface to get food and to keep uh, all the crew from killing each other, being underwater. But, But they can stay underwater. But they would stay up to three months. They can stock 90 days of supplies for that whole crew of water and food. They have to get food and water every 90 days. I asked him, when you're underwater like that, how do you avoid when there's, you're out in the middle of the ocean when a storm comes up? If it's, you've seen the YouTube videos, you've seen on the news the big storms, a giant, you know, 50, 60 foot waves that toss those, those giant container ships around like they're just little toys in the bathtub. How do you avoid, and a submarine's not that big, how do you avoid being tossed around like that? He says, well, he, whenever there's a bad surface storm at sea, he said they would dive deeper. And they would get to a place known to sailors as the cushion of the sea. And he said, they would never even feel the storm. 
He says, as a matter of fact, they would have to surface sometimes to, to see if the storm was still going on because when you get that deep, sometimes your communications are gone as well. And all the, although the ocean would be, uh, would be whipped into huge waves by high winds on the surface, the water deep below, they're never stirred. In the same way, the Christian's mind will be protected against the distracting waves of worry, trouble, fear, if it's resting completely in the peace of God or God's cushion of peace. There, sheltered by His grace and encouraged by His Holy Spirit, the believer can find the perfect peace that only Christ can provide. Notice Jesus' distinction between what he gives and what the world gives. He says, I do not give it to you as the world does. And then he goes on to say, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The obvious conclusion is that even though Jesus doesn't give trouble or fear, the world really does. So watch out for the world. But if we have the presence of Christ's peace, the troubles and fears in the world, uh, fears the world hands to us won't distract us from, from the contentment and the peace that we have in Christ. As the Philippian passage teaches us, God will guard our hearts and our minds. How will he do this? By giving us peace that tells us that no matter what is going on in the world around us or in our lives, we are still content in knowing that we have salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, the presence of peace doesn't mean the absence of all problems, okay? I don't want you to, go, I don't want you to leave out here thinking, wow, I got peace, I don't have... No, 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 no. That doesn't mean the absence. You remember the chorus the angels sang at Jesus' birth, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Were they claiming there would never be any more sickness or dying or pain? No, no, no. They were praising God for the fact that with the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, there would be inner peace for all to come to him in faith. All of those that come to him in faith, there'll be inner peace. God promised us in Philippians 4, 7 that his job is to guard our hearts and our minds with his peace. And I hope this is as comforting to you as it is to me. Uh, the last area we'll consider today is the toughest one. The practice of peace. And it's, it's one thing to experience the presence of peace. Knowing that, that God is in control. You know, I don't, have any, I don't have any problem knowing that God is in control. I don't. Even when the world's going nuts around me and spinning out of control, I have no problem. I have no problem believing that God is in control. He, he, he knows the future. He's already seen. Nothing surprises God. But it's really another thing to practice peace with those around us. Paul writes to the Colossian church, he says, Let the peace that Christ gives rule in your hearts. As part of one body, you were appointed to live in peace. Not only are we to experience this peace individually, but we're to experience it as a church. One time a man's third grade daughter was doing her homework, really working hard, really intense, hunched over and writing, that her dad became curious and he asked her what she was doing. She said, I'm writing a report, third grade, I'm writing a report on the condition of the world and how to bring peace, she said. The father said, isn't that a pretty big order for a girl your age? Her dad asked, oh no, she said, and don't worry, there are three of us in the class working on it. She was pretty confident, wasn't she? Very enthusiastic maybe, enthusiastic, maybe a little bit of an optimist. But maybe she's setting a good example for the church. There will be peace in the church when we individually experience the inner peace of Christ and allow that peace to flow out into the body. Now, I could talk about church fights and I could talk about failures that I know of, but that won't help us today. What, what we need to focus on is the great strength that happens when we practice the peace of Christ with one another. The church that finds itself drawing on the inner strength of Christ united together is the indestructible church. And if you find yourself satisfied in Christ, and I find myself satisfied in Christ, and we allow that satisfaction to spread, there won't be any room for bickering or complaining or turmoil because we will be focused together on Jesus and what he has done and is doing among us. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Roman Empire set out to conquer the known world, and they were almost successful. They pretty much had most of it conquered. They also tried to stop Christianity from spreading. But the story is told of a Roman leader who made a coffin symbolizing his intention to bury the Galatian, 
Jesus by killing his followers. He soon learned, he soon learned that he could not put the master in the coffin. He couldn't get him in there. The story goes on to say that he finally surrendered his heart to Jesus, realizing that the united body of Christ and its living head, the Lord Jesus, cannot be destroyed by the onslaught of mere man. There's a, the history of the church has been represented by a painting of a picture of an anvil with many worn out hammers lying around it. And beneath this picture are the words, one anvil, many hammers. In other words, been a lot of people try to destroy the church through the years. A lot of people, but Jesus is a strong anvil and all these hammers are, and they're worn out because they cannot defeat him because he is undefeatable. We see in here people all over the world calling out for peace, and we see people protesting and holding up their signs, calling for peace. And although we hear the words and we see the protests and the signs, we don't see any real peace, do we? Because the only peace this world has to offer is a false peace. But in Jesus, we have true peace. The peace of contentment, the peace of assurance, and the peace of knowing that no matter what is going on in the world, we still have Jesus and a personal relationship with him. Billy Graham wrote in 1953, I am convinced that there is a great hunger of mind and thirst of soul on the part of the average man for peace with God. All humanity is seeking the answer to the confusion, the moral sickness, the spiritual emptiness that oppresses the world. All mankind is crying out for guidance, for comfort, and for peace. That's in 1953 he wrote that. The world has, long, has, the world has grown larger in power and in knowledge since 1953, hasn't it? And we've crammed our heads full of facts and information, and we have access to just about anything we ever want to know at the tip of our fingers. The computers in 1953 were about the size of about half of this room. Now, this little phone has more power and knowledge and storage and, and, and is quicker than that computer from 1953. So, so I, there's, not, there's just about nothing that I can't find out from this right now at the, at the, at the tip of my fingers. And yet, nearly 70 years later, hearts remain empty. Lives are anything but peaceful. And nothing seems to satisfy. Why are we still empty? Billy Graham writes, "Because we're still empty because the Creator made us for Himself. And we shall never find completeness and fullness apart from fellowship with Him. Never. We were created for fellowship with God, and we will never find real peace apart from a relationship with Jesus. The entire message of the Bible, the one message God is still writing into the hearts and lives today is the message of Christ and his offer of peace with God. Woven, woven through the fiber of every generation, all, through, all throughout all of history is this incredible, amazing story of God's unrelenting love. It's a story of grace and redemption and forgiveness, and it's a story that's bigger and better and more powerful than any other story, and it's the greatest and most important true story of all time. And here it is. Here it is. You're thinking, you're here today, and you're thinking, this is great. I want that peace. I, 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 I want to meet that. I want to meet that I, I want to get that peace in my life. I need that. I want to meet that Jesus. I need to know who he's, I need, to, I need the peace that he's talking about. Here's the story. God created the world. God made man in his own image. God and man had perfect fellowship. They walked together and talked together. Man had perfect peace through an unblemished relationship with God. But then man sinned. The penalty was death. Man began to die. Fellowship with God was broken. A great separation was caused between God and man. It was a chasm so deep and wide and dark that nothing man could do could ever get across the divide. But God still loved. Even from the moment sin entered the world, the plan for redemption was being written by our loving God. For ages, man struggled to be right with God. Sacrifices were made. Blood was shed to cover sins and restore fellowship. But man still fumbled and stumbled. Sin-stained hearts, destroyed lives, led to death. 
The world was broken. Humanity was cursed. More sacrifices were made. Were made. Man still sinned. God still loved. Man continues to sin. But God did not give up. Then came Jesus. And Jesus was God's son. God incarnate. Fully God, fully man. Perfect peace personified. He came to earth as a man, lived as a man. He didn't sin. He loved people and he taught people and he worked miracles and he did the impossible. And he flipped the whole hopeless story of man on its head. Sin's cost was death. But Jesus offered life. Man's situation was hopeless. But Jesus brought hope. War had been waged since the fall of man. But Jesus offered peace. Peace with God. But peace with God required sacrifice. So Jesus sacrificed his life in order to make a way for us to have peace with God. He was crucified on a cross. His innocent blood was shed. He was the final perfect sacrifice. He died. And he was buried. And he was really dead. But three days later, he rose again. Hallelujah. He rose again three days later. Amen. Amen. He rose again. And he did what only God could do. He made a way where there was no way. He works in ways you cannot see. He'll make a way for you and me. God will make a way. His resurrection was the final nail in the coffin of the curse of sin and death. Sin was once and all, once and for all, defeated. A bridge was built across that great divide between God and man that we can cross over. Jesus made a way. Now he offers salvation. And he offers forgiveness to all who will believe and trust in him. And by his blood, through his sacrifice, we can made, be made right with God. Through Jesus, we can have the most important kind of peace there is. Peace with God. Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says this, speaking of Jesus. God was pleased to have his whole nature living in Christ. God was pleased to bring all things back to himself. That's because of what Christ has done. These things include everything on earth and in heaven. God made peace through Christ's blood by his death on the cross. Billy Graham wrote this. He said, the world will never know peace until it finds it in the cross of Jesus. Never know till you find it in the cross of Jesus Christ. You will never know the peace with God, the peace of conscience, the peace of mind, the peace of soul until you stand at the foot of the cross and identify yourself with Christ by faith. There is the secret of peace. This is peace with God. The greatest story ever told, the hope of all mankind, the door to real lasting peace is the cross. So do you want that peace today? Do you have that peace today? Maybe you have that peace and you've, you've forgotten what it costs for you to have it. Maybe you have that peace and, and, and you, can't, you can't find it anymore because you've dwelt on the things that took the peace away for so long. What will you do? Dave's going to play just quietly on the organ and I want you to think about this. I want you to think about what, you, what can I do to find that peace. It's, it's, it's here. It's there for you. That blessed assurance that Jesus can be yours. But you have to accept it. You have to receive it. You have to put away all that other garbage. When you lay it at the feet of Jesus, leave it there. Don't drag it back with you. Leave it there at the feet of Jesus. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. There may be somebody here this morning that, that wants that peace. That doesn't, that doesn't even know Jesus. I just told you a story of what he did, the sacrifice that he made. All you have to do is receive him into your heart. This morning you say, I want that Jesus. Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me. I receive you as my Savior because I can't save myself. 
If you feel that way, if you, if, you, if you need that, if that's what you want, if you say that prayer, you are born again because he does what he says he does. You may be a believer who's struggled for so long. You know Jesus. You know he lives in your heart, but you just can't let him control your life. You just can't give it all to him. You keep dragging those, that garbage around with you everywhere you go. Today is the day you need to just leave that garbage at the, at the foot of the cross. Just leave it and walk away. And as you do, you'll feel such a peace. You'll feel a weight lifted off your shoulder. What will you do? Let's just take a minute. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. I want you to reflect on that. Because just in, in just a moment, we're going to partake of, of, of God's Holy Communion and I want you to have your heart right. You need to know that in in our church, we have open communion. You don't have to be a member of our church to take communion here. But we do ask that you be born again. It's a serious thing. It's not just something we do because we've always done it. We're recognizing the sacrifice that Jesus made. The sacrifice that he made for you and me. So you need to get your heart straight. You need to pray. You need to, you need to pray now, Lord, I want to walk in your light. I want to be clean in your presence. Father, thank you the sacrifice that you made for us. Thank you for what you did for us. Thank you for the blood that gives us strength. Thank you that you never lose your power. Thank you that you work in our lives. You are the God of peace.